Good morning, RCC family. Good morning. We want to welcome you to our Sunday morning worship here at the River City Christian Ministries. My name is <laughs> My name is Sawa Thomas. I'm one of the brothers that serve here at the River City Christian Ministry. I want to welcome you back, friends, family, co-workers, and those who are watching for the first time, we welcome you. This morning, we want to open up with a scripture to encourage our hearts this morning because we came here to worship the Lord. So Psalm, Psalm 100 reads, Shout for joy to the Lord, all you earth, all the earth. Worship him with gladness before, come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is, it is he who, is, who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues throughout all generations. Amen. So this morning, you know, you, we, we've come to worship God. Yes. And that's our, that should be our focus. So I, I challenge you to clear your mind, clear your thoughts, and really just help us to help yourself to focus on God. So regardless of how the week was, this is a new day. This is a day we've come to worship the Lord with thanksgiving. And we want to praise his name because like the scripture says in verse five, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. Let's open up with a prayer. Father God, thank you so much for how you love us, God. Thank you for how you take care of us. Thank you for how you watch over us. God, it's so encouraging, God, how you even just woke us up this morning, God. God, just that we get this time to set aside to worship you, Father. Father, we are grateful for all the things that you have done, all the things you will do, God, all the miracles, all the blessings, God, even all the trials that we've gone through, that we are here to say that we can worship you. And yet we know that your love endures forever. God, we are truly thankful and humble by, and we stand in awe of you this morning, God. I pray that you open wide our hearts to receive the message. I pray that you open wide our hearts as we worship you and we praise you with everything that we have. We love you, we thank you, and we praise you in your son's name. Amen. Amen. My Redeemer. My Redeemer. Sent to a rugged cross. Sent to a rugged cross to set me My free. Savior. My Savior, my sins. bear my sins just to rest my in me. My replacement took my place, took my place so I wouldn't have my to provider. die. My provider, now I have, now I have everlasting my life. Redeemer. My redeemer sent to a rugged cross sent to a rugged cross to set me my free savior. my savior bear my sins bear my sins just to rescue my me my replacement took my place took my place so I wouldn't have my to provider. die my provider now I have now I have everlasting Life. Just to know him, just to know him, Jesus, Jesus Christ, the Son of the Living God. Just to know him, just to know him, Jesus. Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, risen Savior, risen Savior rose from the dead, rose from the dead so I can rise awesome again, ruler. awesome ruler, crucified, crucified just to call me Hope friend, of Hope of glory, one day I, one day I would get to see his I face, grateful. I am grateful. He loved me enough. He loved me enough to gladly take my place. Just to know him. Just to know him. Jesus. Jesus Christ, the Son of the Living God. Just to know him. Just to know him, Jesus, Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Oh, how he cares for you, cares for me, cares for me. Oh, how he cares for you, cares for me, cares for me. 
Oh, how he cares for you. Cares for me. Cares for me. Oh, how he cares for you. Cares for me. Cares for me. I don't know why and I can't explain it, but the victory is won by the Father's only Son. Just to know Him, just to know, just to know Him, Jesus, Jesus Christ, the Son of the Living God. Just to know Him, just to know, just to know Him, Jesus, Jesus Christ, the Son of the Living God. Just to know Him, just to know, just to know Him, Jesus. Jesus Christ, the Son of the Living God. The Son of the Living God. Just to know Him, just to know, just to know Him, Jesus Christ, the Son of the Living. 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 Jesus Christ, the Son of the Living God. Amen. Amen. Good morning, family. Good morning. My name is Willie McMeans. I'm here today to do communion. I just want to thank Mark, the leadership and for just giving me this opportunity, but most of all, I want to give praise and glory to God. Amen. Also with me today will be Kenya Dixon. Uh, she's gonna share what the cross means to her. Amen. Before I begin, I just want you to know, to me, communion is encouragement for our soul. Amen. So, you know, so much is guaranteed by the body and blood of Jesus. We just gotta remember that, believe it, and you know, we believe it, it'll happen. Everything can happen as a result of it. I want to go with a verse from the Old Testament. You know, it's kind of preparation for this. It's Isaiah 5, 3, 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our inequities. The punishment that brought us to peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. You know, I think about that. When we talk about communion, a lot of times we just talk about our sins being forgiven. But also, through, through the blood and the body of Christ, we can be healed. Right. If, if we do communion right, you know, do it in remembrance of Christ, do it knowing that it's not done because we're sinning. It's done because we need to know the real reason. It's done because of what Christ died for, what he did for us, the things he did to prepare our lives to, to where we can share and be with God again. Amen. And the second verse I'm going to read right here is going to be from Peter 2.24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Amen. You know, it's amazing how this is done. And Isaiah prophesied that this will happen about seven years before it actually happened. 700 to 800 years before it happened. The same verse in the New Testament talks about the same thing in the Old Testament. And you know, it, it, no matter what happens in your life, as long as you go to Christ. You know, even if your soul is tormented, God has already forgiven you. You don't have to worry about it. Jesus has already planned ahead and paid your debt. And it, he knew it was going to happen even before he got here. You know, it's amazing how God works. Okay. And I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 25. For I received from you, from the Lord, what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He said, In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For who, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death and, until he comes. You know, the important thing about this is, like I say, is when we take communion, we need to take a moment. We need to just reflect on what Jesus has done for us. 
We need to be still, be quiet, and examine ourselves before the Lord. We need to be get disconcerned and knowing that this is about Jesus. This is not something what, that we do just to be doing. This is something that we do because the Lord calls us to do it. And because, because of this communion, like I said, we can be healed. We can be we're saved from our sins. And as long as we can discern what it means to Christ, no matter what goes on in your life, and you're taking communion, you can renew everything. You get your, blood, your life gets better. If you're sick, you can be healed. You know, your sins are cleansed. So just be grateful to God for what he has done for us. Amen. Thank you. And Kenya will tell you what the cross means. Amen. All right. So good morning, RCC family and friends. <laughs> um, my name is Kenya Dixon, and I serve as a member of the RCC. I'd like to thank our elder and our leadership for the opportunity to share what the cross means to me. When I think about what the cross means to me, I think about the many things I've been able to experience since becoming a Christian. Forgiveness, love, peace, humility. I mean, the list can go on and on forever. But the one thing I've experienced that elevated that feeling of forgiveness, love, peace, and humility is healing. Um, that's what the cross means to me. Life has thrown me some terrific highs and some tremendous lows. I've faced many situations like my mother becoming sick from cancer, um, then my grandmother dying of cancer, and my grandmother and I were very close, so she practically raised me. And then I, years later, became ill from a disease that I just, I never knew of. Um, through the challenging years with Graves' disease, I had many nights in the hospital alone with no family, and even bad days where I wasn't even sure that I'd be able to make it through the day. Sorry, I'm getting a little emotional. It's okay. <sighs> okay. But God kept me for a good reason. He even allowed me to birth two beautiful babies through having Graves' disease. All of these challenges were extremely difficult, and they all caused me a great deal of pain emotionally and physically. But the hardest challenge I've ever had to face was getting a phone call from my sister at 6 a.m. on August 2nd, 2018, telling me that our stepfather had committed suicide. Although I had my biological father around me for most of my childhood, my stepfather was everything to me. He was my biggest cheerleader. He always encouraged me and was the one most responsible for always spoiling me. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I already can't see with my glasses. Good grief. <laughs> okay. <sighs> Hearing that he was gone filled me with so much pain, and I just wasn't sure who could heal that pain. I remember calling Patrice and Sawa that morning, and the first thing out of their mouths were, baby, we are praying for you and your family. And the crazy thing is, I've always heard that phrase, but this time I absolutely believed it. I'm so grateful to God to have Patrice and Sawa during that time because they helped me in a way no one else could, which was God's way. The continuous prayer, the phone conversations, the hugs, and the love, it was just unbelievable. After my stepfather's death, I came to realize God was the only one who could heal the kind of pain I had in my heart. I attempted to study the Bible plenty of times at RCC, but this, this time it was much different. I was able to get real with God and be open with the women in my study group about what I was really struggling with in my heart, which was selfishness and unforgiveness. Doing the cross study helped me realize that my selfish and unforgiving ways is what led me to living my life of sin and just not knowing but understanding that my sin is what put Jesus on the cross. Knowing that every time I sinned, it was equivalent to putting him on the cross time and time again. And I decided I no longer wanted to put Jesus through that. Amen. Because my pain is what led to me being selfish and unforgiving. It cost Jesus pain that he thought I was worth. It caused him pain that he knew would heal me of mine. On November 16, 2018, I gave my life over to Christ and I began understanding that repentance, prayer, forgiveness, and love was the key to trusting God for my breakthrough and healing. Like 1 Peter 24, 25 says, <laughs> he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed for you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. The more I followed through with God's plan for my life and trusted him, he continued to heal me. He continued to come through and healing me time after time. Despite how others have treated me, 
or will treat me, I will not, it, it will not interfere with God's plan for my life because what they meant for evil, God intended for good. Amen. Like Genesis 50, 20 says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. The scars of my past serve as my testimony to my family and friends. It is an example of the saving and healing love of Jesus Christ. Spiritually, I will be two years old in November. Oh, <laughs> oh, and God is continuing to heal me every day in my aspirations, my health, and my mind as I renew my thoughts every day. There was a time I aspired to finish school, to not have kids, to not get married. <laughs> and, um, you know, now I stand before you 27 years old. I have two beautiful babies, and I just celebrated two years of marriage with my awesome husband. Amen. Um, I, you know, like I said before, I thought there were days where my disease would take me out, but here I am eight years later, strong and closer to remission than I've ever been. <laughs> and I used to think I was alone, but God assures me that I don't have to suffer alone, nor do I have to figure out how my healing will be restored. God has been my healing and my strength, and as long as I continue to face day-to-day -day situations, I will always seek the cross for healing. I know that God has the reputation of being in the fire with me and delivering me from any weapon that can form against me. Like Isaiah 54, 17 says, no weapon forged against you will prevail, and you will refute every tongue that accuses you. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and this is their vindication from me, declares the Lord. To God be the glory. Okay, let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you for the gift of your son, Lord. I just thank you that you loved us that much. I just pray that we can just return that love to you and to each other, Father God, as you desire. Love is everything. And just giving your son proves that to us, Father God. I just pray that as we do our communion today, that we remember to be quiet and just focus on Jesus, focus on the cross, focus on his blood and his body, on what he has done for us, Father God, the healing he has given us, the sins he has taken away. Father, just be with us through the rest of the service and be with us always. And thank you again for all your love. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Tim Young. I'm one of the deacons that serves here at the RCC, and I have the honor of preparing our hearts as we transition into our tithing portion of the service. Um, the, the, the information for tithing is at the end of the, the message where you can give online. Um, please go ahead and look at Deuteronomy 10, verse 14. We're going to look at that. It says, Deuteronomy 10, 14, to the Lord your God belong the heavens, even the highest heavens, the earth, and everything in it. So this verse tells us that everything belongs to God. Nothing belongs to ourselves. And when we think about tithing, I think about giving. And give is to transfer the freely transfer the possessions of something to someone. And so we, we, don't, we have possessions, but they're really not ours. They really don't belong to us. And so everything that we have, we need to give to God. Um, and, and I mean that by saying just the heart to give, by giving our time, by giving our, you know, uh, our efforts and everything that we that we do, we give to God by having a heart to want to love and give. And, and we do, of course, give our 10% uh, of our earnings as well and give and tithing in that way. So let's go ahead and pray for the tithing. Amen. Amen. Father, we're so grateful, Father, that you give us so many things, God, that you are a giving God. Uh, thank you for giving us your son, God. We thank you for giving us life and giving it to us to the fullest, God, and just giving us everything you give us, God, our abilities, our talents. Father, the, the money that comes in that we, we work, but we are given everything, God, and that money is not ours. We want to have open hands to freely give it to people who need it, God, to the, to the church, to building of the kingdom, and uh, anyone who has need, God. Help us just to be a, a giver by heart, God, and know that everything belongs to you. It's so in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, RCC family and friends. God is good and all the time. My God is good. It is great to continue to bring our service to you. And thank you so much for chiming in and listening in and be a part of the RCC worship service. I'm excited today to introduce you to Kiana Charlie, who's bringing a message for, to us today. Amen. <laughs> He's a deacon of our music ministry, and he's married to Shadarian. And uh, I'm really excited about the Charlies 
and all they have, uh, God has blessed them so much. Their kids are Christians. Uh, their mom and dad are Christians. So it is pretty cool to uh, see what, how God has used them in such a powerful way. And I'm, he's, during this time that I've been out with my knee, he's, he spoke uh, about a month or so ago. And so I'm excited about hearing him share again the word of God. Uh, God has really, uh, I want to say to all the brothers, thank y'all so much. Uh, for um, stepping up and serving and giving your hearts and bringing the word of God. Uh, I'm very grateful and thankful. My, my, my wife, not my mom, but hello mom, but my wife said to me the other day, said, you know what, the RCC in good hands. I said, you better believe it. I'm very grateful and uh, even though I, I, God, I'm willing to be here for many more years, but you can take me home anytime you want to. I'm very grateful uh, for what the RCC is doing and the impact they're making through our community. Uh, brother, I, I love you so much. I'm so grateful for what God is doing in your life. He's also one of our, he's a fireman in Jacksonville. So, amen. Uh, he's a first responder. And, uh, and his wife functions as a nurse or uh, what? what? Uh, technology. In, in technology at the hospital. And uh, so they both uh, at the hospital at different times. So I'm just very grateful for how God has used you guys. And not only in the church, but serving our community. Thank you so much for your service. Uh, I, brothers and sisters, let's pray. And the next voice you hear after my prayer will be our brother Ken bringing the word of God. Uh, let's humble our hearts. Let's be willing to sit down, listen and learn and grow. I'm eager uh, to sit down and listen and learn and, and hear what God has to say through our brother this morning. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for all your blessings. Thank you so much for Willie's word. Thank you so much uh, for our sister sharing about what the cross means. It was good to see uh, Kenya share and share a heart. I'm so grateful for that. And now, God, I pray uh, and be with. Thank you for the brother sharing about the tithe message and his heart's there, Father, and Tim. And now, Father, we want to sit down and we're grateful to hear Ken bring the word of God. God, we love you, we honor you, we praise you, we lift your name up to the skies. And thank you for being able to meet the needs of the body of Christ during, during a pandemic, Father, that we're still able uh, to be in our homes and reach out to one another through uh, group me and through social media and using it for the good and not the bad. Father, thank you so much again uh, for our brother bringing us the word. Please guide his words, every word that come out of his mouth, God. Lead them to, to our hearts to draw us near to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And the church says, Amen. Good morning, family. Good, Good morning. morning. I am grateful to be able to have another opportunity to come into your home uh, to share God's word. Uh, thank you for all my guys, my friends at Station 28 who may be viewing this, uh, all my brothers and sisters at RCC, all the family members and visitors that may be watching. Uh, just thank you for worshiping with us again this morning. Amen. If a lot of you don't know, my best friend outside of my wife is Sal Thomas. And Sal and I have this, our own personal way of not really trying to top each other, but always kind of like propping, each, propping one another up higher than the other. So one day, I come across a Jacksonville magazine, and it says, the top dentist in Jacksonville. And so I'm flipping through it, and what do I find? I find my dentist. So I'm feeling pretty snazzy about myself. Now, just so happens, I happen to have met my dentist. Talked to him, I uh, helped out my son with some wrestling and everything, and, you know, just had some conversation. So Sal, if you don't know, works in dental technology. And uh, one day I uh, said, hey, man, uh, do you happen to go by my dentist's office? He was like, yeah, I go by there from time to time. I said, well, hey, tell him I said hi. He's like, OK, I'll tell him you said hi. So Sal goes and he's like, hey, yeah, one of my friends come here. He's like, oh, really? He does? He's like, uh, what's his name? He says, Kenyatta Charlie. He says, who? <laughs> he says, Ken Kenyatta Charlie. He says, huh. Well, they're mutual friends that he names two other people. He goes, oh, I know them. He's like, oh, God, I know their kids are great. They played soccer. And, you know, we did so much. And I say that because this is so common today. We can think we're so connected into people's lives that we have this implied assumption of a relationship of who they are because of what we think we know of them. Now. now, as Paul would say, allow me a little foolery. Okay. But I don't care how many albums you've purchased of Beyonce. 
I don't care if you've even attended Coachella. And that, for you people, are super fans or you think you're BFFs. This is one fact that is true. She has no idea who you are. Now, as laughable as it is, we do this with actors, musicians, but it's alarming that many of us do this with God. Now, right now, people have changed. You said, hold up, hold up. I know God. I gave my life to him. I got baptized. I go to church. I serve. I give contribution. I believe in him and I know him. Okay. Well, let's examine believe and knowing. Let's go to James chapter 2, verse 19. I'm just going to read this real quick. It says, you believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. So those are demons that believe in God. They know, okay, God exists. Let's go to Acts chapter 19, verse 13 through 15. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sevilla, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I know about, but who are you? So I, I guess we should be able to agree that simply knowing who God is and believing is not enough. That's right. But, but you know what? Let's look at this totally different. Does God know you? I'm not asking whether you know God. Does God know you? So now let's look at the examples of people that God knew. We're going to go to 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. And it reads, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elijah were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here. The Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of the prophets at Bethel came out to Elijah and asked, do you know the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, Elijah replied, so be quiet. Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? I would say that God knew him. I'm going to go to Job chapter 1, verse 8. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on the earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. I don't even want to look at everything else. Let's just stop right there. God said his name. Yes, He said, have you considered my servant Job? Let's go to Exodus chapter 33, verse 7 through 11. Now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the tent of meetings. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to that, go to the tent of the meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrance to their tents, watching Moses until he entered the tent. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they all stood and worshiped, each at the entrance to their tent. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Face to face as one would speak to a friend. Well, you know we love definitions here at the RCC. Oh, yes, we do. And today's word is no, K-N-O-W. Now, the first thing about the word no is, is it's a verb. So that means it requires an action. Yes. But it lists two definitions. The first definition says being aware through observation, inquiry or information. Now, if any of you have children who have been around children, this is them. Because as soon as you tell them something, what's the first thing they say? I know. Yes. So that is I know. But there's a second meaning. And it says 
Having developed a relationship with someone through meeting and spending time with them, being familiar or friendly with them. I want to share a quick story uh, about my wife, Shadarium. Um, years ago, when we were both in the same, same singles ministry, uh, we went to a singles function in Tampa. They were having a dance. And I noticed this sister. It was just, man, I really want to get to know her. And so we're going there. Uh, she rode with some other people. I drove myself. And so it's like a little sock hop. It was fun. I mean, you know, it was just a great time. So they put the sisters on the other side, had brothers on the other side, and they told us to line up. And so, I mean, who would know that the chances of that? I just hum somehow out of God's. I just happened to end up in front of her. Who knew? Like, who knew that when she looked up and was like, oh, wow, what are the chances? So later on that night, uh, her ride had to take care of something else. And, and it wasn't uncommon. Sometimes we just all met other needs. So I was going back to Jacksonville. So I'm like, OK, God, I really wanted to serve it. And really pure intentions. It's like, well, hey, you know, I'll be willing to give you guys a ride back. So but in my mind, I'm like, OK, this may be it. I, I might get a chance to talk. We're going to ride all the way to Tampa, from Tampa all the way to Jacksonville. So she's in the car, I'm in the car, she's in the back, and you know, everybody's kind of tired. I'm driving, and you won't believe what happened. She Absolutely nothing. <laughs> now I say that because Shadarian did not know me, and I only knew of Shadarian. I needed to take the time to get to know her. Regardless of how much I felt, I needed to take the time to get to know who she was, what she was, what made her happy. I feel many of us have a modern view of what it is to know God, but we must have the second one in order to be called Christians. I know we've had many times that we've preached on having a relationship with Christ from praying, spending time in his word, telling people that we believe and our love for God. But out of all of that, the one thing of how God knows us is my first point. God knows you through your obedience. I know it sounds very basic, but if you know me being a firefighter, I'm also a paramedic. Before you can become a paramedic, you have to become an EMT, which is an emergency medical technician. You're learning the basics. There's three things that we live by as medics. ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation. Now, as a medic, I can want to do all the things. I can want to push drugs. I want to defibrillate. I can do all those things. But if you don't do those first three, you will die. I don't care what medication I give. Nothing will breathe for you. I can do all these other things. I can fathom all these other things. But if I do not do the basics, you will die. It is the same thing when it comes to obedience to Christ. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 7, verse 22 through 23. And the scripture reads, we've read this many times. It will say, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. Mm -hmm. Now, when we read that, the first thing you think, well, you know, these weren't Christians or who they were. or They were they were bad people. But this is a warning because the heading of that passage says true and false disciples. It didn't say the world. It didn't say unbelievers. It said true and false disciples. So let's look at the things that they did. They prophesied. They cast out demons and performed many miracles. But the one thing we have to realize, all the miraculous things they did, they themselves didn't do. God did it through them. But they were not able to receive credit because guess what? They did not know God. God even says, I never knew you. We're going to look at verse 21 of that same chapter. It says, not everyone to me says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. What is the will of God? Now, we can name a lot of things. There are a lot of things that are the will of God, but all of them can be summed up in one word. Obedience. That's right. In James chapter 2, verse 23 through 24, 
we're going to read about Abraham. It says, and scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see, a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. Come on. Come on. We can take all the belief that we want. But what are our actions showing daily basis to God? Do our lives show that outside of our belief, our belief is shown through our obedience to his word? That's right. So what are we saying if we sin, if we're just constantly sinning? Because now, Greta, we are not perfect. We will fall short. I want to look at Mark chapter 14, verse 66. And this is Peter around the fire. It says, while Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You were also with that Nazarene Jesus, she said, but he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said, and he went out into the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there, she said it again to those standing around. This fellow was one of them. Again, he denied it. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. He began to call curses down and he swore to them. I don't know this man you're talking about. I know we get caught up in the three times of the denial. But do we realize that to the world we say this man, I do not know who you're talking about. We scream it loudly where we preach one thing. But our lives says something totally different. Yes. Right. I'm not saying this to call Peter out. I'm saying this that it should cause us to reflect yes. about what our lives say to those that are lost. That's right. yeah. And we, we are challenged with our lives. Do we fight and push through or are we saying that we don't know who Jesus right. is? My second point is when we don't obey. It shows we truly don't know God. In John chapter six, verse 25 through 67, we're going to spend a little time here. It says when they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, you were looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Are we looking for Jesus or are we just looking for his blessings? Are we just receiving our fill? But let's continue in verse 27. It says, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the son of man will give you. For on him, God the father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So you see, we must work obeying his commands and work is to also believe in the one who was sent. You cannot have one without the other. Mm -hmm. You cannot have one without the other. So to conserve some time, I'm going to kind of read back uh, for, for verses 30 through 52. Now, this is interesting because. When we start to get challenged in our lives, we start to question things. So right now they're being challenged. So they are now challenging back to Jesus because it's uncomfortable. So they read, they say to Jesus, quoting scripture, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. So what are you going to do? It is something to challenge Jesus. But one thing about it, God never, Jesus never made God's work about him. He just replies back. He says, for the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They reply, sir, they said, give us this bread. Jesus declares in verse 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Now, in verse 41 through 43, the Jews begin to grumble about this. This is a hard teaching, Mm -hmm. but this is no different than our lives. Where are the hard teachings that we begin to grumble? Where are the times that we begin to question? And guess what? These were disciples. Right. That's right. That's right. These were disciples. 
And it reads at the Jews there begin to grumble about him because Jesus said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he say I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling amongst yourselves, Jesus answered. When he challenges them, it reveals their sinful desires. Amen. Where are the times that we start to grumble? What are the things that we feel God hasn't done or hasn't answered? God hasn't come through for us that now we question. We question who he is. We start to say, I don't know the man. In verse 53, we're going to read through 60. Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drink my blood has eternal life and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I am them. Just as the living father sent me and I live because of the father. So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died. But whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? What are the hard teachings that God is teaching you that you can't accept? Come on. Come on. What are the hard things that God calls for in order to be a Christian? To say that you know him, to validate that he knows you, that you have a hard time with. Aware that the disciples were grumbling, we're picking up in 61. Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you see the son of man ascend to where he was before? The spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. See, Jesus already knew all the people following him didn't believe. They may have thought they knew Jesus, but Jesus didn't know them. We tend to think that right here he's talking about Judas, but he said the disciples that didn't believe and the one that was to betray him. He went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the father has enabled them. From this time, many disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Do you not want to leave too? Jesus asked the 12. If these people seeing the miracles that Jesus performed were able to walk away from him, how rooted are you to have never met him or seen him, but trust and stay in his word? Out of everything we just read, I want you to see that it was disciples, people who said they believe, people who walked, that left. It is sad to already know people are, that are lost and then to think that you're not and come to find out that you were never any different than they were. It's very crucial that we are not simply attending a church with a group of people. We must know what it is to follow God's teaching, to be taught and to be held accountable. Yes. One of my favorite verses, and this verse resonates more and more with me as I get older in life and the older I become as a Christian. First Timothy chapter four, verse 16 says, watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. When most people think of hearers, they think of the world and they think of our co-workers. But my first hearers is my family. My family have seen me in my ups and my downs, and they see me in my struggle and my fight not to give in the to, into the temptations that Satan may bring. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, it says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you, that you can endure it. Amen. In being married to my wife, it has been the greatest test of my character in fighting to honor God first. Amen. And in honoring God first, I know I will honor my marriage and honor my, honor my wife through my actions. Amen. Now, 
I do know that if I were to run into problems, and I don't say this just casually, but I know if I were to be unfaithful to my wife, I could be broken, I could repent, I could be forgiven. And with a clear conscience before God, I know I could still see him in heaven someday. Now, I don't simply say this just to say it. What grieves the Holy Spirit is when we're having all that we know, what it is to love and obey Christ. We simply say at the time we choose what may be the easiest thing as far as our flesh. I, too, like Tremaine, like movies. There's a movie that came out back in the early 2000s called Never Back Down. And it's a movie about a young man that has anger issues because his father died in an accident that he could have prevented. So his mom and her younger brother and him, he's kicked out of school. They have to move someplace else. The younger brother is a tennis prodigy and the older brother still wrestling with aggression starts training at a local gym. But being picked on, he takes the skills and the moves that he learns and he starts to get in fights. Well, one day he comes home and the youngest brother got into a fight at school. Seeing the younger brother with a black eye, he asks the younger brother, he's like, uh, what about the other guy? The younger brother replies, what about him? Showing a little delight, like, OK, you got the best of him. The mother replies to the older brother, says, don't you see that he watches you and he wants to be like you? She says, you know what? I understand that we all get mad sometime. And she takes a glass and throws it against the wall and it shatters. Everybody stops and they look. She tells the youngest son, pick up the plate and throw it down on the ground. And he throws it and it shatters. She asked him, she said, how did that feel? He said it felt good. Seeing that the mother had blown off a little steam, the oldest son looked at the mom and said, well, how did that feel, mom? She said it felt good. But she said, there is still a mess that needs to be cleaned up, and that's my job. When we give into our sin, not thinking of the ramifications for other people, we throw glass in front of them. It hurts them. We have to see that our actions can hurt the faith of those around us. And it definitely gives the world no chance of knowing or seeing who God is in our lives. Are we fighting to give into our feelings or do we just simply know that God will be there to clean up our messes? As Christians, we're supposed to be cleaning up other people's messes. That's not to say that we're perfect, but through training and desiring to want to live for God, not because you have to, but because we want to. We're glad to be obedient because obedience gives life. In John chapter 14, 21, it reads very simply. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my father and I, too, will love them and show myself to them. So we see that God will reveal himself to us by us loving him, by us obeying him. It goes even further than that. In verse 23, Jesus replies, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come and make our home with them. That is something. When I think of home, I think of looking forward to my family, uh, my wife. Uh, home is a daily part. Home is daily. It's, it's every day. That's where I return. That's where that's my base. That's where I live. That's where I commune with those closest to me. Amen. Does do you does God live in you or are you just allowing him to visit from time to time? Do you and God, you know, are, are you in a relationship with God? Maybe you are. Maybe you're renters. Maybe you got a 12 month rent with God. And at the end of that 12 months, hey, Jesus, this is cool. Are, are we going to re back up or I'm, I'm looking at this other place. What about you? You could be on the last you could be on the last verges. You could be going month to month. But do you have a home together? Did you sit down and sign together to say, hey, we're going to live here together. Amen. We're going to build a life here together. I think sometimes we take portions of our life like the rent and we, we drop off to God, leaving for weeks. But we call him up like a good roommate asking for a favor because guess what? My roommate's reliable. He always answers the phone. 
Yo, bro, I'm going out of town this weekend. Uh, be good. I'll catch you when I get back. See, in a home, I don't go away for weekends. It's like, hey, babe, I'm coming home. Every time I leave the fire station, I'm heading home. Do you need me to pick anything up? I'll see you soon. In James chapter four, verse four, verse four through six, it reads, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enemy against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? Come on. See, we're a home. God wants to dwell inside of us. But he gives us more grace. That is why the scripture says God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. God longs to dwell within us. But if we're not obeying God, how can he dwell within a place like that? We often allow God to visit when we need him, but then we go back to our old ways, allowing Satan to tempt us with our evil desires. What we don't want to happen is this. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 43 through 45, it reads, when an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself. And they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. Yes, That's how it will be with this wicked generation. Right. Come on. Good stuff. Now, I know right now we're like, Ken, where's the grace? <laughs> where's the mercy? Talk to us. Where's, the for, Talk to where's the forgiveness? Well, guess what? We have that. Yes, we, do. we have God's grace. Yes. We have his mercy. We have his repentance. But let's read in Romans chapter six, verse one through four. And it says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the death through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Yes. It is grace knowing that we have God's mercy. I am thankful that I have God's, that I can repent, but I'm even more grateful knowing that I have God's Holy Spirit that allows me to be more like him. So we strive daily Fighting to be more like God, Amen. using the Holy Spirit, not simply giving into our ordinary temptations that Satan brings. The one thing that I've learned, and this is true, Satan can only offer. That's right. Satan can only make an offer. Right. Jesus offers, God offers something, and Satan can only make a counter offer. Which one do we choose? That's right. For some of you, this message, if you're listening this morning, it may mean that God is giving you an opportunity to truly to get to know him Amen. and for him to know you That's right. through baptism. For some of us Christians, hopefully this is a call to deeper our convictions yes. where that we need to continue to know through us that not only our belief, but our obedience goes hand in hand. Right. And for those of us that are obe obeying and do believe we haven't arrived. That's right. We have it arrived. Let's continue to encourage one another daily, holding each other to God's teaching until we all see him and hear him say, as Matthew 25, verse 23. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. And to God be the glory. Amen. Amen. Good morning, family. Good morning. My name is Brian Vereen, and I'm a member here that serves at the RCC. And I just want to respond to the great message that our brother Kenyatta Charlie just brought to us. 
brother. Um, I love being challenged, being able to go out to something. And you challenged me today with, uh, number one, the conviction I gained is knowing that when you read the scripture about the disciples, them being with him and them turning away from him and me being uh, not meeting Jesus physically and not seeing the, the miracles that they seen. He, he's done miracles in my life, but just physically seeing that, like, am I going to walk away at some point? I don't, I don't, I don't want to see myself doing that. So I thank you for that. And just hearing this message, it made me look at where we are as a nation today. Uh, I know it's important that we just can't go to church amongst a group of people and just just go to church. We got to hold ourselves account accountable. And uh, I know that our actions affect more than just, say for example, me in this room right now, it's gonna affect more than just us. Yes. It's a bigger, it's more eyes out watching, yes. seeing what a Christian faith looks like. Yes. Seeing what, am I holding myself accountable? Is this something that I take serious? Yes. You know, and I think that's a challenge as well that we keep that in mind Amen. when Satan is tempting us. Like you said, he only provides an offer. That's right. But, but God provides a way out every time. So I thank you for that, brother. I'll give you another round of applause. Amen. And with that, let us pray. Amen. Father God, we come before you this um, today. Just tell you thank you for the awesome uh, service. Thank you for uh, Ken and the word he brought, Lord, just challenging us to, uh, to get to know you, to make sure you know us through our obedience, Lord, through our sacrifice, Lord, through... Through, through just being led by the Spirit, Lord, and not ourselves. Help us to just hold ourselves accountable, Lord, and, and not uh, shake back when those aren't watching, when eyes aren't on us. You see everything, Lord, so that's a lie. And I pray that we don't believe that uh, you're not, um, your eyes ain't on us all, at all times. So I pray that uh, we just gain convictions daily to be better for your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.